This is WBKD, and welcome to today's broadcast. Simply Tax recently brought you the entertaining neo-noir-styled short film, The Missing Deduction. The renowned Mr. Quincy Benjamin Ingrid Donaldson, known as Cubid, has disappeared, and private investigator Taxation Simple is on the case. Mr. Simple sets out to solve one of the greatest mysteries of the tax world, and suspense, intrigue, and a bit of humor ensue. Catch up on the thrilling hunt for answers before listening to the broadcast today by visiting bkd.com slash missing dash deduction. And now we bring you the thrilling conclusion of our drama. Chris Craig, Emma Elliott, Ted Dickman, your host Damian Martin, and producer and sound man Aaron Ferris star in the worldwide premiere of the radio drama, The Aggregated Assault. It was a cold Tuesday in Taxville. I was taking in the air on the way to the office after stopping by the neighborhood diner to read the tax code over my morning cup of joe. I had been working 25 hours a day, eight days a week to hit the deadlines. You see, I work in the tax department, a world of records and files, but also a place you can find outstanding tax minds. Minds that have appreciation for depreciation. Minds that can crack a deduction. Minds working for one goal, to cut through the static of the tax world. That's my job. I'm the host of Simply Tax. My name's Damian Martin. Ten thirty-one a.m. I was in the area, so I decided to stop by to see Annie Story, Taxville's ace investigative reporter. With the mysterious disappearance and shocking reappearance of Mr. Quincy Benjamin Ingrid Donaldson, I wanted to see how her story was coming along. Just doesn't make sense. I understand how it's working. Code section 199 Gap A. Who is it? Damian Martin of the Simply Tax Podcast. Oh, uh, Mr. Martin. Come in. Please, call me Damien. I just thought I'd stop by and help cut through the static of the case of the missing deduction. Oh, I'm sorry to snap my cap, Damien. We sure have had a lot of excitement around here lately, and I'm just so agitated by this story. Oh? Here I thought tax had Internal Revenue Code Section 199 Cap A cracked, and then Mr. Cubid reappears and adds a whole new dimension of color to the case. You know, based on those I've been talking to... You aren't alone in feeling a bit overwhelmed by the concepts and planning points related to Section 199 Cap A. And that's after more than three years of dealing with it in practice. Thanks, Damien. Suppose I don't have to be so hangdog about it. Look, I appreciate you stopping by and all, but I've got a three o'clock deadline to meet and... Hold on a sec. Annie here, what's your story? Annie. Mm Mm-hmm. Tomorrow's paper is needed to go out early. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to need your story by 2 p.m. 2? You got it. Sure thing, IRS. 2 p.m.? Now how am I going to do that? IRS? Yes, my editor's name is Irene Rita Sullivan, but she goes by IRS. Sounds like your IRS deadline is coming sooner than you thought. Tell you what, let's take a ride and spend some more qualified time with Mr. Carl P. Albright. CPA? That's our man for your story, and he can help shed some more colorful light on yet another complex aspect of Section 199 Cap A. Oh? You see, Annie, I don't think it's agitation you're suffering from, but aggregation. All right, I don't get it, but I'm sure that's some sort of tax-related humor or something. You tax folks and your tax jokes. We're deductible, aren't we? A real gas. All right, Mr. Comedian, we've got to hurry if I'm going to get this story in by two. As we left the office, call me a funny duddy, but I couldn't resist fitting in a few more tax buns on the elevator ride down. That guy's got a tax bun, you know? We hopped in the car, fired it up, and started over to CPA's place. Got me thinking about the first time I ever met CPA, which was yesterday, after Mr. Cubid reappeared. He's a sharp tax mind and the founding and sole member of the newly formed Simply Tax fan club in Taxville. 
We arrived at CPA's office just as I finished my walk down memory lane. That's all you need to document your participation in the activity. Damien Martin, come in. If it isn't the sharpest text guy I know. How are you, Carl? Oh, oh uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No problem. I was just finishing up with my newest client here. Damien, meet Doc Dickman, one of the finest dermatologists in Taxville and business partner of Doc Brown. It's a pleasure, Doc. Pleasure's mine, Damien. You've been helping me cut through the static of the tax world for years now. You know something? You sound taller on the podcast. Well, he certainly isn't short on tax jokes. Tax jokes. You saying you don't appreciate them, Eddie? Oh, you really fracture me with all your antics there, Groucho. Now, how about helping me explain why Mr. Cubid brought some Technicolor to Taxville yesterday? Sure thing. Carl, may I please borrow the volume of your Treasury regulations with Section 1.199 Cap A-4? Wait, I thought you were going to keep this simple and sweet. Treasury regulations? I'm getting there. You're due for a break in your story, and I have a hunch we just need to unpack the regulations under Section 199 Cap A a bit more. Here you go, Damien. Aggregation is the tops in my book. There's that aggregation again. I haven't the foggiest what you're talking about. You see, ma'am, the regulations provide a regime that allows you to aggregate two or more trades or businesses for purposes of applying the limitations when calculating QBID when certain criteria are met. If you have multiple trades or businesses and you're facing the W-2 wage or qualified property limitation, you might consider the elective aggregation regime. That's right, Carl. And would you be so kind as to break down what it takes to qualify for aggregation? First, none of the aggregated trades or businesses can be a specified service trade or business. That's specified service trade or business as in an SSTB, right? That's right, Annie. Second, There must be 50% or more direct or indirect ownership by the same person or group of persons for each trade or business being aggregated. Now, just how do you indirectly own something, may I ask? Simple, but not easy. You need to look at the attribution rules under Internal Revenue Code Section 267B or 707B, which outline certain related party relationships that attribute ownership to you. I generally put them into two buckets, family, and certain entities and organizations. Carl, care to help with members of the family? Yeah, the uh, members of the family included in the covered relationships under Section 267B include siblings, spouses, ancestors, and lineal descendants. What do you mean by ancestors and lineal descendants? Ancestors include parents, grandparents, and ancestors beyond grandparents. Lineal descendants include children, grandchildren, and lineal descendants beyond grandchildren. So what about nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws, and step-relatives? Not included, and you don't attribute ownership for this purpose. You've got it covered. And would you also break down the second bucket of entities and organizations included in covered relationships? Yeah, happy to. It also includes certain relationships involving corporations, partnerships, trusts, and charitable organizations. Certain relationships? Yes, the code section is pretty specific, and there's a dozen of them, starting with an individual and a... uh, Actually, any chance you can just summarize it for us in plain English? Yeah, sure thing. Though there's no substitute for the fine print when you apply these rules, and it's best to check out the statute before applying them. So generally included are individuals and certain entities where 50% in value of the outstanding ownership is owned directly or indirectly by or for such individual corporations that are members of the same controlled group and trusts or not-for-profit organizations controlled directly or indirectly by such person or by members of the family of such individual. I believe you said something about Section 707B. How does that fit in? Ah, yes. Partners in a partnership and the partnership itself are not included in the covered relationships under Section 267B. However, Section 707 and Treasury Regulation Section 1.707-1 do apply for purposes of aggregation under Section 199 Cap A. These relationships are not only important here, but in other provisions of the Internal Revenue Code as well, like the rules limiting losses, expenses, and interest deductions for transactions between related parties. That's an excellent point, Carl, and good reason to remember who is included and who isn't for this purpose. 
Oh, and on that 50% or more ownership requirement for aggregation purposes, it's important to consider the ownership must exist for the majority of the taxable year. Also right, Carl. Aggregation requirement number three. So we have no SSTVs. You must have 50% or more direct or indirect ownership by the same person or group of persons. And that ownership must exist for the majority and the last day of the taxable year. What's the fourth requirement for aggregation? All the items attributable to each trader business are reported on income tax returns with the same taxable year, not taking into account short taxable years. Okay, boys. So what's so difficult about those requirements? Seems straightforward to me. Well, perhaps other than those attribution rules and figuring out if you're dealing with an SSTB, of course. True, but that's not all, ma'am. In addition to the four items I just mentioned, two out of three common characteristics must also be present. Exactly. First, the products or services provided must be the same or generally offered together. Second, they must share facilities or have significant centralized business elements such as personnel, accounting, legal, manufacturing, purchasing, human resources, or information technology resources. Or third, they must be operated in coordination with or reliance on one or more trades or businesses in the group. Okay, that seems less straightforward. Just the facts. It all comes down to the facts, ma'am. Speaking of not being straightforward, it's also key to mention that a trade or business may be aggregated only if the individual or relevant pass-through entity can demonstrate that each trader business independently meets the definition of a trader business for purposes of Section 199 Cap A. Is that the same trader business idea you were just explaining to me, Mr. Albright? Sure is, Doc. And your situation is the perfect example for illustrating. Mind if I share? By all means. I take it you're suffering from aggregation as well, Doc? Yes. The uh, skin cream Doc Brown and I sell doesn't seem to be helping treat it. So what's the skinny on the doc here, Carl? Well, outside of his dermatologist practice, Doc also has a few rentals that rise to the level of a Section 162 trader business. Wait, I thought Mr. Cubit owns Trader Business LLC. No, not trader business, trade or business. Okay, I suppose you just need to crack open your handy copy of the Internal Revenue Code here and get the definition of trade or business under Section 162, right? Not quite. Then how do I get the lead here, fellas? By reviewing 100 or so years of case law. <sighs> yeah, I suppose it sounds a bit callous. But hey, no one said the tax world was simply easy. Let me see if I can simplify the complex here for you. Hmm. Damien, I've got an idea. Miss Story, you have plans for dinner this evening? Well... I suppose that depends. On what, ma'am? You making a pass at me, pal? What gives you that impression, ma'am? Well, the context, I guess. So it sounds like we can't just look up the context in a book? Very clever, fellas. So I take it context is important for determining if something is a trade or business? Precisely, Annie. Since the term trade or business is not defined in the Internal Revenue Code, Treasury Regulations, or in other IRS guidance, the term has been defined and determined by case law and by use of the term in other areas of the tax law, given that there are relatively few cases that address trader business status under Section 162. It's also been a bit of a moot point in the rental real estate context, given that Section 62A4 allows an above-the-line deduction for expenses attributable to a property held for the production of rents under Section 212. So it's not miscellaneous itemized deduction information? No, sir. Now, in terms of the other areas of tax law, case law involving sections 172, 871, 1221A2, and 1231, including their predecessor sections, rely on the same factual considerations as that for purposes of section 162. I think it's best summarized in the preamble to the final regulations under section 199 Cap A. It says this determination is inherently a factual question, and Treasury and the IRS acknowledge that there is no uniform standard. That doesn't sound straightforward at all. Well, it's not. But I'll give you an important lead that I think many overlook in this analysis. An activity must rise to the level of a Section 162 trader business based only on the activity of that activity. Activity by activity? That's right. 
In other words, you can't look to other activities held by the taxpayer. And contrary to what I've heard some say, this isn't particularly new in the rental context. PLR 9840026 states, the issue of whether the rental of property is a trade or business of a taxpayer is ultimately one of fact in which the scope of the taxpayer's activities, either personally or through agents, in connection with the property, are extensive enough to rise to the stature of a trade or business. <sighs> I could tell I was getting under her skin with all the tax gobbledygook. I love talking tax, but from experience flapping my lips to the missus and the kids at home, I could tell it was time to move on, land the plane, dock the boat, get off the train, and I was just about to suggest you check out my top five takeaways from the case law on the subject, nicely packaged into a video on the Simply Tax YouTube channel when... Say, Damien, what's a YouTube? Well, it's a... Wait, you can hear that? Sure can, Ace. 1124 AM. Note to self, reevaluate the use of inner monologue and ask Shrink why everyone seems to be hearing it. Say, have any notes to self in there on where you're going with all of this and how all of this relates to Mr. Cubid? Miss Story was clearly keen on moving things along. Since this seems to be on broadcast, Carl, mind continuing with the facts on Doc's Reynolds to help us boil down aggregation? Sure thing, Damien. Doc here owns 75% of a residential apartment building and also owns 80% of a limited liability company taxed as a partnership. Doc's Boxes, LLC. Doc's Boxes, in turn, owns 80% of the interests in a residential condominium building and 80% of the interests in a different residential apartment building. The residential condo building owned by Doc's Boxes and the residential apartment building owned by Doc share centralized back office functions and management all of the buildings operate in coordination with each other and renting units to tenants and are the same type of property. We have the best units in Taxville. You sure do, Doc. So, absent a way to treat these separate trades or businesses as one, Doc would be facing a limitation since wages are only paid by the back office function, meaning the deduction for the buildings would be limited to only 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of qualified property immediately after acquisition since 25% of zero wages is zero dollars. And I'm no zero. Fortunately. Doc's boxes may aggregate its residential condo and residential apartment building operations since the businesses are of the same type of property and share centralized back office functions and management. Doc may also add his residential apartment building operations to Doc's boxes aggregated residential condo and apartment building operations since the businesses operate in coordination with one another. The regime is elective if these criteria are met which I'm sure, as you noticed, aren't the same as the grouping rules under Section 469. Oh, yeah. Obviously. So, with the election in place, you get to treat multiple trades or businesses as a single trade or business for purposes of calculating the wage and capital limitations under Section 199 Cap A. It's important to note as well that the election is irrevocable, and you are required to report consistent with the election from year to year unless there has been a material change in facts. And, of course, there's an annual requirement to disclose your aggregation at the RPE and or individual level. That's right. Each year, you must attach a statement to the tax return or each owner's K-1 for RPEs that provides the following for each trader business aggregated. A description of each trader business, the name and employer identification number of each entity in which the trader business is operated, Information identifying any trader business that was formed, cease operations, was acquired or disposed of during the taxable year. Information identifying any aggregated trader business of an RPE in which the individual or RPE holds an interest, and such other information required by forms, instructions, or other published guidance. Yes, Carl, and mining the disclosure details is important here, as the IRS can disaggregate under the regulations if the criteria aren't met. Full disclosure here, fellas. This is all swell, but I have an afternoon of appointments to get to. Yes, of course, Doc. We've been running you ragged with all the tax talk today. Say, when do you think you can get me those documents for your tax returns this year? I'll stop by a day before the deadline with the shoebox I keep them in. That ought to give you plenty of time to work through them, right? Sure thing, Doc. That's just the way CPAs like it. Say, Carl, 
have you asked him to use the text technology of the future that we discussed in episode 34 of the podcast? You bet I have, but as your guest Dave Weil says, change change is super hard. hard. Oh boy, it's nearly lunch and I still need to get to that stack of tax returns over there before the mail goes out today. No problem, Carl. I could talk tax with you all afternoon, but there's clearly work to be done. We'll show ourselves out. Now, just a minute. I still don't see what any of this has to do with Mr. Cupid. My deadline? How could we forget? CPAs love deadlines. You sure do. CPA helped us with the concepts. We'll apply them on the way back to the office. 11.32 a.m. We thank CPA for being the tax-minded citizen he is and headed back to the car to get Miss Story back to meet her deadline. Hmm, well, that's interesting. What's that? The car. It won't start. Ha ha, very funny, Mr. Tax Jokes. Let's get a move on. There's already next to no way that I'm going to make this deadline at this point. I wish I were joking, Annie, but the battery is simply dead. Dead? Yeah, I suppose I shouldn't have left my podcast equipment running while we were meeting with CPA. You record podcasts in the car? Well, sure. That's how I fit in recording all of my episodes, between serving clients and being home for the family. Simply podcasting. I don't believe this. I'm going to miss the biggest deadline of my career because you left your microphone running? Not so fast, Annie. I think I can help simplify the situation and still have time to enlighten you on Mr. Cubit's transformation for your article, all at once. Don't tell me you're going to suggest I write my piece while riding a bike back to the office. That's a good idea. But no, we just need tax little i. You talking tax code again? Not quite. Taxi? Now we're cooking with gas. One ninety ninth and A Avenue, please. Sure thing, boss. Wait, is this thing safe? It looks so different and colorful. It really stands out from the everyday gray, just like Mr. Cubit did yesterday. That's right. And did you notice who owns it? Wait, the Donaldson Taxi Company, as in Quincy Benjamin Ingrid Donaldson. That's right, Annie. Mr. Cubid is quite the business mind and owns several in town. And why is it so yellow? Have your notes handy from our conversation earlier? They don't call me the top investigative tax reporter in town for nothing. I find taking notes and reviewing notes is the best way to learn and understand tax, whether you are new or have been around the tax world for years. I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, would you be so kind as to flip back in your notes from earlier to the requirements for aggregation under Section 199 Cap A. Okay, but I don't see where you're going with this. You said it yourself. Mr. Cubit owns several businesses and probably has half the town on payroll. Why would he need to be concerned with aggregation and avoiding the wages or property limitations that Mr. Taxation Simple unpacked for us yesterday? I hear you, Annie, and that's a common misconception. But remember, Section 199 Cap A generally applies on a per-trader business basis. That is, of course, unless you aggregate. Aggregation. Found it. Great. Now, what are the three common characteristic criteria under the aggregation regime? Let's see. The products or services provided must be the same or customarily offered together. They must share facilities or have significant centralized business elements such as personnel, accounting, legal, manufacturing, purchasing, human resources, or information technology resources. Or they must be operated in coordination with or reliance on one or more trades or business in the group. That's right. And of course, you only need to meet two of these three, along with the other four criteria Mr. CPA boiled down for us. Right. So... Applying it to Mr. Cubid, what's his ownership in Trader Business LLC? That's not to be confused with a Section 162 Trader Business. <laughs> That's right. Mr. Cubid owns an 80% membership interest in Trader Business LLC. And what does the LLC do? Well, they operate a retail store that sells the finest widgets and tax bill, of course. 
Mm -hmm. And does Mr. Cubid own any other trader businesses with common characteristics to Trader Business LLC? Well, I suppose he also owns 80% of Manufacturer Business LLC, which manufactures and supplies all of the widgets sold by Trader Business LLC, as well as 100% of Building Incorporated, which owns the real property leased for use by the factory and the retail store. I see. And do they share any significant centralized business elements? Why, yes. They have common advertising and management. Well, then, it sounds like our friend Mr. Cubid was facing the wage limitation since he didn't have enough wages in Trader Business LLC for the full deduction. However, Mr. CPA, being the sharp tax guy that he is, saw that and aggregation allowed the wages limitation of Section 199 Cap A to be calculated for the combined trader business rather than for each individually, bringing some color to his wages and allowing Mr. Cubit to appear even greater. Yes, you certainly are tax able, Damien. Thanks, Annie. And your well-timed tax bun there really just made my day. Now hold on. I get why Trader Business LLC and Manufacturer Business LLC can be aggregated since they are trades or businesses that meet the common ownership, SSTB, and common characteristic requirements. But what about Building Inc.? Does it even rise to the level of a Section 162 trade or business as a rental activity? That's a fantastic question. You see, Building Inc. is eligible to be included in the aggregated group as well because it leases property to a trader business within the aggregated trader business, as described in Treasury Regulation Section 1.199 Cap A-1B14. And therefore, it meets their aggregation requirements under Section 1.199 Cap A-4B1. Boy, you were right, Damien. This aggregation stuff really did clear up my agitation. It was tight, but I got Annie back to the office to meet her deadline, and she even landed the cover story. It seems there's always a tax angle, and Mr. CPA helped Mr. Cubit follow the letter of the tax law and use the aggregation regime under Internal Revenue Code Section 199 Cap A to reduce the overall tax burden and make a big difference in the final outcome. Just goes to show you, employing a tax CPA with a forward-looking approach to developing tax strategies can allow you to take full advantage of the benefits within the tax law, like 199 Cap A. Another case closed. I'm Damian Martin, and thank you for listening. The information contained in this episode of Simply Tax is based on data available as of the date of its release. BKD is under no obligation to update this information if changes occur. Applying this information to your specific situation requires careful consideration of all facts and circumstances. Any information provided is not to be considered as tax, legal, or financial advice. Please consult your tax advisor before acting on any matters covered.